So one of the other main traditions we look at in this course is the consequentialist tradition. Utilitarianism is one of the main varieties of consequentialism, but there's this overarching kind of framework in ethics that says a very natural thing, it's a very, very commonsensical thing, the right thing to do in a given case is the thing that's going to produce the best consequences, or at least the thing that you think reasonably is going to produce the best consequences. And sometimes it's hard to figure out, but you should at least do your best. Kant is probably the most famous non-consequentialist. So what, it, what does it mean to be a non-consequentialist? Kant's gonna say that what we should do in a given situation is look for a rule or a principle that we take ourselves to be able to follow and to follow in a perfectly rational way. How do we evaluate what's perfectly rational? It gets very complicated here, but at least one very uncontroversial thing to say about rationality is that it prizes consistency. So to be rational is to try to be consistent. So consider a case of theoretical consistency. If I say, you're sitting here watching me give a lecture, and you're also out walking your dog. That looks inconsistent. And if I insist, no, no, like you are sitting here watching me give a lecture and you're out watching your dog, and I guess we have to take into account that you're not watching me give the lecture on your phone while walking your dog, in which case it wouldn't be an inconsistency. Um, it looks like we're violating some kind of law, a law that reason lays down for us. We should be rational. To be reasoning beings is to consider the fact that consistency is a kind of requirement for all of us in empirical and theoretical cases. And what Kant wants to say is that we can take that thought about being consistent and apply it also in practical cases, in moral cases. So what does it mean to be consistent in a moral case? Well, this is also very complicated, but one thing to say is you should will or do something, act on a principle, that you take to be something that everyone in your situation could will or could act on. So don't make an arbitrary exception of yourself. Don't say, I can do this, but I wouldn't want everybody else to do that. Or I can maybe cheat a little on my taxes, but of course I, I don't think everybody else can do that. Or I can snag this thing from the store because nobody's gonna notice. And you know, you might even think the consequences aren't that bad. So a consequentialist could say, this might be okay. Kant's gonna say, you're making an arbitrary exception of yourself, which is inconsistent. There's nothing importantly different about you that allows you to lie or steal or cheat and that doesn't allow everybody else who's rational or a person to do the same thing. So to be consistent is to do the kinds of things that you think everyone else in your situation should also do. So when we're trying to be consistent in a practical context, we're looking for a kind of universal law. And sometimes Kant characterizes this as a universal law. He's looking for the most fundamental one, really, and then he thinks that we can generate other more specific ones about what we should do in a given context from the most general one. The most general one he sometimes calls, and you might have heard this term in a Kantian discussion, the categorical imperative. What's the categorical imperative? Well, what's an imperative? An imperative is, a linguist will tell you, is a kind of sentential mood, right? It's a way in which we tell someone else or yourself what to do. You say, go pick up your socks, or go walk the dog, or just walk the dog. That's an imperative. Um, but there are different kinds of imperatives. You might think that some imperatives are just means to end imperatives. Kant calls these hypothetical imperatives. So if you want the dog to be happy, then go walk the dog. That's a hypothetical imperative. If you want your living room to be clean, then you should go pick up those socks. Another hypothetical imperative. But there's no kind of moral injunction there. It's not that you know, the living room must morally be cleaned. It's not categorically required that we clean our living rooms. But Kant thinks there will be cases in which you can take off that if you want business and not just make it a means to end sort of imperative, but rather just a straight up categorical imperative. So be consistent, again, would be the most fundamental one. A hypothetical imperative would be if you want to get a tax break, give a certain percentage of your money to charity. The categorical imperative would just be 
you ought to give a certain amount of your money to charity. Now, how do you generate a categorical imperative if you're not using means to end reasoning? It's important to point out that the categorical imperative, which just says something like, be consistent, don't make an exception of yourself, do the thing that you would want everyone else in your situation to do, isn't saying that you can't make adjustments or sort of respond to new data or even revise your view. So it's not be consistent in the sense of never change your mind or be dogmatic. Actually, Kant is really against dogmatism. Um, he's open to new data. He's interested, he's following all these historical developments involved with the French Revolution and so forth. He's thinking harder about how his views relate to women and animals and so forth, and ends up changing some of his own moral views as he goes along. So he himself is not consistent in the sense that he keeps his same picture all the way through. The, the goal is just to be consistent in the sense of not making an arbitrary exception for yourself or for some group of special privileged people um, that you don't want to make for everybody else. So look for rules that are unexceptionable, that are totally consistent, fundamentally something that all rational persons, all rational beings should do. So that's the formula of universal law, as he sometimes calls it.